ברוכים הבאים רבותיי, ותזכו לשנים רבות, נעימות וטובות. Welcome to a special edition of our Thursday night class. בעזרת השם, we are just a few days away from חג הפסח, זמן חירותנו. Of course, the highlight of פסח is ליל הסדר, and the highlight of ליל הסדר is the מגיד, is the recitation of the הגדה. It's important that we prepare not only our homes to remove the hametz and prepare the kosher food, but it's incumbent that we prepare ourselves mentally for this great mitzvah. Just like eating matzah is a mitzvah from the Torah, it's also a mitzvah to recite the Haggadah Shil Pesach. And therefore we need to spend some time in our hachanot, in our preparations, to educate ourselves in some of the paragraphs of Haggadah Shil Pesach. Tonight, I'd like to focus on one of the paragraphs, Baruch Shomer of Tachatol Yisrael Baruch Hu. In the chapter we say, Blessed be the one that keeps his promise to Israel. Baruch Hu, blessed be he. Borei Olam kept his promise. What was the promise? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Ishevet HaKetz. HaKadosh Baruch Hu calculated the Ketz, the ending. La'asot kemo she'amal le'avram abinu. Like he told Avram Abinu, Bebit ben Abetarim in the covenant. Shneemar vayomed la'avraham, Yadowa teda ki geri yehye zar'acha be'eres tonahem, Va'abadum ve'innu otam arba me'ot shana, Ve'gam et tagoi asher ya'avod u'dan anokhi, Va'chalikin yitzu berchush gadol. God had told Avram Abinu way before we went into the exile, That the Jewish people are going to be in a land that does not belong to them, Be'eres tonahem. And they're going to be under great servitude. It's going to be torture. And how many years is that going to last? It's going to be a 400 year ordeal. But don't worry. The oppressor, Dan Anochi. God says, I'm going to judge them. And after that, the Jewish people will indeed leave with great wealth. Our question tonight is very simple. A very basic analysis. God told Abraham the exile is going to be 400 years. Arba me'ot shana. But we know that it was only 210 years. What happened to the other 190 years? Where did those years go? How was the galut mitigated? How was it that the galut was almost cut in half? There has to be an understanding to this. How could Arba Me'ot Shana turn into 210 years? Interestingly enough, this number 210 was alluded to at the beginning of the Galut. When Bori Olam tells Yaakov Abinu to go down to Egypt, what does he tell him? What language does he use? He tells him and his family, Redu Shama. Redu. The numerical value of Redu is how much? 210. As if Borei Olam is giving Yaakov Abinu a hint. Redu Shama. Go down to Egypt for Redu Shanim. So I'd like to offer some of the well-known interpretations to this answer. And tonight I'd like to offer a novel interpretation as well. Some of the famous interpretations are as follows. The Gemara Megillah says, Kol makom shegalu Yisrael, Shekhina galta imahim. That whenever the Jewish people go into exile, they're not alone. The holy Shekhina goes with them. The af kamzot behiotam beores beeres oy behem lo maastim ve lo gealtim. God says, even when the Jewish people are in the exile, beeres oy behem lo maastim. I did not despise them. God comes with us into the galut. As the Pasuk says, Imo anuchi besara. God empathizes with us. I feel your pain. As a matter of fact, the first time that Bore Olam appears to Moshe Rabbeinu, 
It's from the thorny bush, the snare. Ask yourself a question. Bore Olam doesn't have a more pleasurable place to appear. Let him appear to Moshe Rabbeinu from a beachfront. Let him appear in the ocean. Why in such an uncomfortable place, a thorn bush? And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, because as long as the Jewish people are in Egypt, I'm suffering also. And my Shekhinah Kavyachal is in pain, in a thorn bush, in a snare. Once we explain that the Shekhinah is with us into the Galut, we can understand that really the Shekhinah also burdened and shared the burden of the exile. If we were alone, we would have to take this total 400 ourselves. But because Borei Olam was with us, Kivyachol, he himself took some of the pain off of us. And therefore that 190 years, that was on God's Hezbon. And that's what we say in Haggadah, Baruch Shomer Avtahatol Yisrael Baruch Hu, Shehakadosh Baruch Hu, Hishem et Ketz. The word Ketz equals how much? Ketz is 190. Kof Tzaddi is 190. Those are the years that were taken away from the Galut. Where did those years go? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hishem et Ketz. God Himself, by being with us in the exile, He was Mehashem the Ketz. He already subtracted from his presence the kits, kits shanim 190 years. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is as follows. During our stay in Egypt, there was a population explosion. The Jewish people, the Jewish woman were giving birth six at a time, six tuplets. And this was a very common practice. Today we don't have that so much, even though we have multiple births. The Zohar HaKadosh says, always before a redemption, there's multiple births. And just like before Egypt, there was multiple births and then we were redeemed, so to an hour time also, to the help of fertility and different, uh, different type of uh, procedures, women are having multiple births. We have somebody in the synagogue, she gave birth to quadruplets. Three boys and one girl. Pressed her in one shot. She gave birth to three boys, right away you had zimun. That's it. Instant zimun. So, the explanation is like this. Of course... We were supposed to be in Egypt for 400 years. But since the population was so great, we were able to fulfill 400 years of work in 210 years' time. Which means, if you have 100 people doing a job, it takes a year. But if you have 500 people doing the job, you cut it down. And then because there were so many people doing the work, there was a certain case that you have to get this much done. 400 years' work. So Kadosh Baruch did us a favor. By making so many Jews working, so we were able to mitigate it. That's the second interpretation. Easy. The third interpretation is as follows. The Pasuk writes, They embittered our lives. Maror. The work that we did was considered avodat parech. Parech means backbreaking labor. Not only physically, but mentally. The tortures that took place in Misraim were unprecedented. And they lasted not for three or four years. The avodat parech of it, that lasted for 86 years. Kiminya, like the gematria of the word Elohim. Elohim is 86 which is the name of God of judgment. We suffered under the severe Elohim, the severe judgment of God's deen, Midat al-Deen. Lehavdil, even in World War II, the concentration camps and the labor camps was five or six years. This was 86 years of this. And therefore the Pasuk says it was mirirut, it was an embitterment of a life. So the Mepharshim say that the work was so difficult and so severe and so acute that 
we were able to do 400 years work in, 80, in 210 years time. Which means since we worked so hard, so therefore that already was able to subtract from the bottom line. That's why the Gaon of Vilna said, If you look at the Ta'amim, the Ta'amim Dikra, the notes on the words, these notes were not made up from some conductor of a symphony. The notes on the Torah, when Bore Olam gave us the Torah, he gave it with the cantillation. And therefore, there's books that explain why every word has the note on it. Why is there a Rabia? Why is there Zakef Katon? Why is there Shofar Mehupach? It's an amazing thing. We think it's just because it's musical. It's got nothing to do with music. A Ta'am is not only a note, but Ta'am also means a reason. The notes explain the Pesukim. Like there's a pasuk by Yosef Sadiq when he was thrown into the pit. It says, And the pit was empty, there was no water. So it says, Mayim Enbo, there was no water. But Nehashim, Nakrabim Yeshpo. But there were snakes and scorpions there. The Gaon the Vilna asks, Where do you see in the pasuk that there were snakes and scorpions? It says, En Mayim, Naborek En Mayim. Where do you see anything about snakes and scorpions? So continue reading the Pasuk. The next word is Vayeshevu. Now if you split the word Vayeshevu, it spells Vayeshbo. Oh, so we're getting closer. But where's the snakes? If you look at the note on top of the Vayeshevu, it's a Zareka. You know what a Zareka looks like? A snake. And therefore read it straight. And therefore the Ta'amim themselves lend interpretation to the Pesukim. What's the names of the Ta'amim on Vaymareru with Hayyehim? The Ashkenazim, they call it Kadma ve Azla. It's like this Kadma ve Azla. Vaymareru with Hayyehim. That's how we would say it. I don't know how the Ashkenazim would say it, but I'm sure they say it in a different way. Vaymareru with Hayyehim. You don't have to say it. Vaymareru with Hayyehim. Kadma ve Azla. What does it mean, Kadma ve Azla? Kadma is they proceeded. And they went. Kadam, Lashon Kodim. They proceeded and they went. Uh, says the government, Vilna, perfect. Why did the Jewish people proceed and go out early? Why did they get 190 years reprieve? Because my mother knew I am. Since the work was so bitter, since it was so difficult, hence, Kadma Vazla. So they, it complements each other. So somebody asked, they said, oh, Rabbi, that's good. But already, if you're going so deep into the Ta'amim, where does it hint in the Pasuk that the reprieval was 190 years? So here I saw a Hidush from the Aptar of the Ba'al Ohev Yisrael, who incidentally had the Zichut to be by his Kever exactly a week ago, when I was in the Ukraine. He's buried two feet away from the Ba'al Shem Tov. And then we were able to go to the the synagogue that they're rebuilding, that the Ohev Yisrael used to pray. In the holy city of Vizhibuj, the city of great tzaddikim. Anyway, I always wondered, why are all the tzaddikim in these far remote places over here, in the freezing cold Ukraine? We have to find maybe a tzaddik buried in Fort Lauderdale somewhere or something like that. I don't understand why they found these places so far off the beaten track. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Pshad you can't become a tzaddik in Fort Lauderdale. Maybe it's Pshad you have to be in these uh, remote places. But we're still looking for some. Anyway, Abdur Rabb says something very good. He says, what's the numerical value of the word Kadma? Kadma, Kof, Dalit, Mem, Aleph. Let's figure it out. Kof is 100, Dalit is 4, Mem, Aleph is 41. So that's 145. Ve Azla, Vav Aleph, Vav Aleph is seven, Zayin is another seven, is fourteen, Lamed is uh, fourteen and thirty is forty-four, and the Aleph is forty-five. One forty-five and forty-five is one hundred and ninety. So Kadma Ve Azla equals one hundred and ninety. So we say, why did the Jewish people Kadma Ve Azla? Why did they get the Zikut to leave one hundred and ninety years early? 
because by Mariru it Hayehem. So it's perfect. It's a Kaftor Vaferach. It's perfect in Meduyak in the Pasuk. With this, we explain something else, which many people are not aware of this, even though they've been doing it for so many years. On the night of the Pesach, what do we do to commemorate the bitterness? We eat maror. Maror zeh. Our custom, the Sefaradim, we eat romaine lettuce or endives. It has a little bitterness to it. Ashkenazim, they eat the horseradish. Oh, that's the real maror. That's the... Just looking at the maror, just thinking about the horseradish, already you have the mirirut. But either way, you're yotze. But everybody has the same custom of what? We dip the maror into the haroset. Again, here we have Mahlokot and the Minhagin for the recipes of how to make the Haroset. Each one follows his Minhag. I told him a story the other night. There was a wealthy man. He had a servant. Ashkenazi. His name was Baruch Hirsch. He told the servant Baruch Hirsch on Eid of Pesach, go to the store, buy for me egozim and tapuhim. Buy for me walnuts and apples for the Haroset. So Baruch Hirsch went to the store, but he delayed. He didn't come back to his master till a few hours before Pesach. So the master got angry. Where were you? I sent you early in the morning for the Egozim to Purim. You show up now, the last minute. Away. What kind of business? Where were you? He lost his uh, cool. And the master started to get angry. Finally, he couldn't control anymore. So he turns to his servant, Baruch Hirsch. He tells him, you, Behema. Oh, he calls him a Behema. So Baruch Hirsch, he calls him Behema. He turns to him, he says, Atta. Oh, he said, you, you are one. Now the master realized what he did. He made a mistake. What did he call him a behemoth? Two hours before Pesach. Now the whole Pesach, they're going to be in Mahloket. So he has to figure out a way to get out of it. So he tells Baruch Hirsch, what did you think I meant when I said behemoth? Behemoth's Rashi Tevot. Baruch Hirsch Maheveta. He says, I know, I answered you. Atta, egozim tapuhim heveti. So you see over here, we have a custom to dip the maror into the haroset. Question is, make up your mind. Are you trying to commemorate the maror or the sweetness? The haroset is sweet. Why would you dilute the bitterness in dipping it into sweet haroset? Even though the halakha says it's supposed to shake it off a little, but still there's mitikut. So it comes out that you're really not eating something that's bitter, you're eating something that's indeed bittersweet. Why? Based on what I'm telling you tonight, we understand. Because in the maror, there was a sweetness, there was a silver lining. And what was the silver lining? That we got out 190 years early. Because we worked so hard, so we were able to take off almost half the sentence. So although it was very bitter, but there's a haroset in the maror. There's a sweetness in the maror. And it's like if you tell the children, winter vacation starts January 20th. But if you could take all your finals and finish the work by January 15th, you get an extra five days off. So they work the whole December, they're staying up all night, they're studying and they're reviewing and they have a very difficult month. It's maror. But when January 15th comes, they take the the last final, they get an extra five days. So so the maror was worth it. The maror gives them an extra week of the vacation. Similarly over here, in the maror there's haroset. And I want to tell you something. That's life. In every maror that a Kadosh Baruch Hu gives a person, you have to know there's always a haroset over there. In every difficult time, in every challenge, in every hardship, in every yisurin uh, 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 that a person has to go through, he has to know that in the mirirut, a Kadosh Baruch Hu always has a reason, and it's letoma, and it's for the good. Sometimes you cannot taste the haroset, but you have to know the haroset is always there. That's a paradigm of life. Maror and haroset always go together. That's what Halakha, according to some of the post scheme, they say, if a person did not dip the maror into the haroset, lo Hashkafically, we understand it. But if a person doesn't understand that in the maror there's haroset, lo you didn't fulfill your obligation in emunah. The emunah is to teach us that both of these things are combined. You cannot separate. Borei Olam knows what he's doing. With this we explained another Hadush as well. In the Haggadah we say, Rabban Gamliel Aya Omer, Rabban Gamliel used to say, Kol mi shelo amash lo shatavarim elu ba Pesach, whoever did not say these three things in the Pesach, 
לא יצא ידי חובתו. He did not fulfill his obligation. ואלו הן פסח, מסע ומרור. These are the three things. Ask yourself a question. רמן גמליאל, פסח, that's freedom. That's when God passed over our homes and we were freed. Masa is freedom. When we left Egypt, we had the Masa on our shoulders. Maror is slavery. The Rabbi Gamaliel, it's out of order. Pesach Masa, he should have said, Maror, Pesach Masa. First, we had slavery, and then we had freedom. And don't tell me that he's giving it to you in alphabetical order, because it's not written in alphabetical order. The Pesach is Pesach, the Mem is Masa, comes first. So what order did Rabbi Gamaliel take over here? Why does he start freedom, freedom, slavery? But based on what I'm telling you, even the Maror is freedom. Because of the Midirut, we got out early. On the contrary, the Midirut saved us 190 years. It was able to chip off almost half of it. Hashem et Akets, 190 years. And therefore he says, Pesach, Masao, Maror, freedom, freedom, freedom. That's the interpretations that we are familiar with. There are other interpretations as well. Some want to say that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Avram Abinu about the 400 years, that was before they were circumcised. But after the Jewish people circumcised themselves, a circumcision is considered a form of death. The Pasuk says, Ki alecha horagnu kolayom. God, we sacrificed ourselves for you every day. How do we sacrifice our lives for God? HaKamim says, Turma brit milah. So therefore, once already we sacrificed ourselves to Brit Milah, after the Brit Milah, we're a different creation. It's like, a, it's like a new Briah. So therefore, who was told to have a 400 years? That's the Jewish people before the Brit Milah. But after the Brit Milah, it's already a different Hashbon. Another way of calculating it. But tonight I want to say a different shot. Nachamim tell us, On the night of Pesach, it's not enough for us to analyze and get excited about the exodus, about the redemption. Of course, you see at Mesrayim, we're thrilled. You have to understand to the level where you feel you yourself were in Mesrayim and you came out. But you also have to ponder on the night of Pesach what got us into the exile? Everybody's always thinking, oh, we got out, we got out, hey, but we got in. How did we get into this galut? How did the exile start? That's also one of the important lessons. Because you must always learn history because history repeats itself. And if we have to know the underpinnings, what's the underlying causes, what's the roots of a galut? So if we go back in the Torah, you'll see the Galut doesn't start in Egypt. It doesn't start in Parashat Shemot. The Galut starts in Parashat Vayeshev. In that episode of Yosef Sadiq and the brothers, no matter how you're going to learn it, there was acrimony. There was a fight. There was a division between the Ahe Yosef and Yosef, the Shevatim and Yosef. Again, we don't come here tonight to Hafez Shalom, speak to berate the Shevatim, Shiftei Ya. And of course, these are great Sadiqim that are beyond us for even to comment. But the Torah clearly says, Vayisne'u Oto. They hated him, whatever that means. But it doesn't mean they loved him. The Pasuk says, Yosef tattled on the brothers. Yosef there was something going on over here. And we cannot whitewash the Pesukim when it says that the brothers took Yosef, stripped him from his ketonet pasim, doused it in blood, gave it to their father and said, Tarof Toraf Yosef, that Yosef was devoured by a wild animal and they sold him down to Egypt. That's the facts. That's where Galut begins. Our first experience with Misraim, the Yosef Hurad Misraim, and Yosef went down to Misraim. That's where it begins from Machloket. When there's fighting from within, when there's Machloket, when already there's fragmentation, when there's factionalism, 
when already in the Jewish family there's arguments and there's a split, that already causes galut. That's where it started. It's no coincidence. We went down to Egypt as a result of a family feud. We went down as a result of a fight. And you have to know that. That's what causes galut. Any time there's going to be a mahloket somewhere, any time somebody hustles should be involved in some type of strife, you must know that not long after this exile, not long after that bar minan, there's a consequence, there's a collateral damage. Nothing good can come out of mahloket. Nothing good can come out of a fight. I once heard a nice dirash. You remember the story when Yaakov Abinu was lying down on the rocks, on the twelve rocks? So it says, the rocks started to fight with each other. I want Yaakov to lie on me. So the rocks were fighting, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu made a miracle, and from the Avanim it became an even. They became one rock, so Yaakov put his head on the rock. Already you're making a miracle. So why don't you turn it into a pillow? Who wants to sleep on a rock, make it a nice, comfortable, goose-down pillow? And you know what they answer? From a mahloket, you don't get a pillow. The rocks were fighting. From a fight, you don't get a pillow. It stays a rock. You never can get beracha from a mahloket. Rav Hayim Palachi told his students, on the place where you see two people had a fight, don't walk over that spot. There's Tuma on that spot. Cross the street. The place itself has a poison in it. Therefore, we have to be from the Ohave Shalom Verotfe Shalom. Not because we want to be diplomatic, not only because we want to be pacifists. Because Hafiz Shalom, there's a price, there's always a price to pay in Mahloket, even the side that's right. It takes two to tango. Once already there's. A, and the Gemara says, so severe is the Mahloket that it even goes after children. Normally, children are exempt from the law. Ketanim. Where do we learn that from? The story of Korah. When God swallowed Korah on the ground, it was Korah v'chol adato and tapav, his kids. And therefore you see how dangerous this is. And that's what the Galut was. The Galut started because of this episode. The man Ishai says something beautiful. And then Yosef Haim in Baghdad writes, if that's the root of the exile, it has to be alluded to somewhere in the Seder. I mean, we're commemorating everything. We have Matzot, we have Haroset to commemorate the Tar. We have Maror. Where in the Seder do we commemorate the brothers that are selling Yosef? That's pivotal, that's key. Do you know what he says? If you look on the Pasuk, in Vayeshev Ketonet Pasim. I have it right here. I'm going to read it to you. Vayeshev. Ve'asalo Ketonet Pasim. Look at Rashi. Rashi says, Lashon Klin Milat. Ketonet Pasim is like a garment. Clean milat, like a linen garment, with stripes. Pasim is stripes. Kemo karpas utchelet. Oh. Rashi talks about karpas. Now I know when you think the word karpas, right away celery comes to your mind. But he's not talking about celery. Karpas over is a combination of two words. Kar, kar is a garment of linen. Pas, pas is stripes. Says Rav Benish Hai. When we take the karpas and we dip it into the salt water, that's a dramatization of the dipping of the ketonet pasim into the blood. He can't dip it into the blood. So we dip it into the salt water, which is the tears, which is the crying of Yosef. Which means in the beginning of the seder, you're coming along and to explain to the people at the seder, this is why it happened, because of the ketonet pasim. Because the brothers couldn't see eye to eye with Yosef. The Galut begins over there. And until Klai Yisrael were able to rectify that sin, it took them 210 years, by the way. But at the end of 210 years, it says, they were united. 
I agree. Maybe they were on the 49th level of Tum'ah. That's something else. But as a nation, there was Ahdut. There was a unity. Ah, God says there's a unity. There's a peace. You go. You're free. And we were free for many years. Until the destruction of the second temple, where we got a, a relapse. We fell back into that original sin of Sun'at Qinam. Again, baseless hatred, which was always our weakness as a nation, it came back to haunt us. This time we paid the price of the destruction of the temple and we were thrown into an exile. Incidentally, an exile that we're still in. In Egypt, we were able to fix our sin in 210 years. Now we're pushing close to 2,000 years of exile. And we still are not able to rectify the sin of Sin'at Hinnam. It's almost ten times longer than the original Galut. That's why our tradition tells us a phenomenon on the Jewish calendar. Always the first night of Pesach is the same night on the calendar as Tisha B'Av. How do you remember that? Al Matzot Umrorim. The same night that you have Matzot is the same night of Mirorim. Mirorim is Shabi'av, is the night of Maror. Al Matzot Umrorim. They linked. But there's another way Hazal tell us to remember it. The first letter of the alphabet is Aleph. The last letter is Taf. At. Aleph of Pesach. The first day of Pesach is Taf, is Tisha B'Av. What, what day is the first day of Pesach this year? Tuesday. Monday night. That means this summer, because that the same shouldn't happen, we should be redeemed by then. But if we're not, Tisha B'Av is going to be on a Monday night. At. The rabbis give us a whole remez. At. Bash. Gar. Dak. Hatz. Raf. You have a minute so I can tell it to you? I'll translate. I'll translate. Did I never translate anything? At. Bash. Alif. Taf. The first day of Pesach. Tisha B'Av. Bash, the second day of Pesach, what's the second day of Pesach? Wednesday. Bash, Shin, Shavuot. Shavuot's on a Wednesday this year. All you have to remember is the seven days of Pesach, and you know the whole calendar. You don't have to walk around, when is this, when is that, when is that. Just learn Pesach. Once you know Pesach, you got everything. At, Bash, Gar, Gimel, Resh. The third day of Pesach is what? Thursday. Resh, Resh is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah this year is on the Thursday. At, Bash, Gar, Dak. Dalid is the fourth day. The fourth day is on a Friday. Kof is Kiryat Torah. That's Simchat Torah. The fourth day, Simchat Torah is on a Friday. Hatz. Hatz is the fifth day, which is Shabbat, which is Sadi, is Som. Som is Kippur. Kippur is on a Shabbat this year. Vav is the sixth day. Vav is the sixth day. Sixth day is Sunday. The Peh is Purim of last year. That's tricky now. Purim goes backwards. Ah, what are you, you're laughing. The other day in the synagogue, we spoke for an hour to explain why the sixth day of Pesach is Purim backwards. Why everything is forwards and Purim is backwards. There's a reason. There's a beautiful reason. I cannot say it tonight, but... There's a whole dope shot. And incidentally, you should know that always, whatever day Purim is, that's like Ba'omer. Nesim Manach, how you can remember that? Pelag. 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 Purim is always lag. So this year Purim is Sunday and lag bomb is also going to be on a Sunday. And there's a reason for that also. There's obviously a connection between Purim and Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. That's what the Hazal tell us. They only give us the six days. So somebody last night when I was giving the shoot and said, Oh, and the seventh day is on a what? The seventh day of Pesach this year is on a Monday. Always the seventh day of Pesach, as Yomah Asma'ut, he said. Okay. I'm not responsible for each guy's uh, uh, derash. I'm sure there was no Yomah Asma'ut in the times of uh, Hazal, that's for sure. But really the seventh night, or the seventh day of Pesach, incidentally, is always Tu Be'av, the 15th of Av. Monday this year is too bad. Why is it like that? Just as a tidbit. 
Because what happened on the seventh day of Pesach? It's Kiryat Yam Suf. What is Tu Be'av? That's the day where the Jewish girls and boys used to frolic in the fields and they used to get married. It was a day of marriage. And what does the Gemara say? That getting married is like Kiryat Yam Suf. And therefore it's befitting that on the day of the Kiryat Yam Suf should be the same day linked spiritually to Tu Be'av. Anyway, our question is, at the first night of Pesach is Tisha B'Av. This is not just a phenomenon on the Jewish calendar. Obviously, Bore Olam and his infinite wisdom spiritually linked these two days. That's why some have a custom on their Pesach to eat an egg. Why? An egg is something that the mourners eat. It's the food of Avelin. So we're reminding ourselves on the night of Pesach, that this is also the night of Avelut. We're already reminding ourselves that there's a day to Shah Be'av as well. But why? why? Why spoil the night? Such a beautiful night. What do you have to even think of the Shah Be'av for? And the explanation is, we're telling everybody at the Seder, learn the lesson of Monday night, Leil Seder. The reason why this happened is because of Sinat Hinnam. The reason why we had an exile is because brothers could not see eye to eye. And if you don't learn the lesson of this Monday night, there's going to be another Monday night in a few months in the summer that you're going to have to sit on the floor and read Echa. And if Bar Minnan Tisha Be'av rolls around this summer on a Monday night, that means you didn't learn the lesson of the Monday night of Pesach. They're linked. The Tikkun of Tisha Be'av is the Leila Seder. Oh, if this is true, we're saying... Where do we see that the Jewish people were united? Where do we see the tikkun? You're saying after 210 years, God said, that's it. What they did to Yosef, it's over. Now it's time for Geula. Where do you see it? So it's an amazing Midrash. Midrash says... Borei Olam tells Moshe, go to Paro and to the Egyptians and tell them you want to borrow their clothes. V'yish'alu ish me'et re'ehu v'yish'a me'et shechinta kele kesef uchle zahav usmalot. We're going to borrow. What do you want to borrow our stuff for? Ah, we have a three-day seminar. We're going in the Midbar for a three-day little uh, carnival and then we're coming back. For some reason, the Egyptians fell for it. And they gave us their gold and their silver and they gave us all uh, their wares for this party. Thinking, naively, that in three days we're going to come back and give them back all their goods. But we knew, what Elam told us secretly, you're not coming back. Take all your stuff, we're getting out of here. This is the Geula, we're going to Eris Israel. it's over. Now this is three million people, they have a secret. They know that this is a ruse. It's a scheme. All it would have taken is one Jewish informer, one moser, or in the vernacular, one rat, to go to Paro and say, My dear king, it's not three days. When Moshe Rabbeinu was telling us three days, he was winking his eye. It's forever. You're never getting back any of this stuff. Now, in three million people, you got to figure there's going to be one person that doesn't know how to keep a secret. One somebody that's looking to find favor in the eyes of the government. One that's trying to advance himself, maybe to get a reward, maybe to exonerate himself from a punishment that he has. Go figure out the psychology of an informant. And out of three million people, you know what it says in the Midrash? Nobody went. They were able to keep a secret. And that's where you see the unity of Klai Yisrael. That they kept the secret internally and they did not incriminate each other by going to the foreign government. You hear what's going on? That's a phenomenal level of loyalty to one another. When Borei Olam saw that, it's time to go. Whereas in the previous generation, the brothers were tattling on each other. 
Here already the tikkun was made. There's a chazal that says like this: Hayam ra'ava yanos. It says the yam saw something, and when it saw this, vayanos, it split. Different things it saw. One midrash says hayam ra'a aronos shel Yosef. There's another midrash, very interesting. Nobody knows how to explain it. I saw a beautiful interpretation. It says, Ra'a. What did they see? What did the Yam see? Braita de Rabbi Yishmael. So Braita. The Yam saw Braita. And when it saw the Braita of Rabbi Yishmael, oh, it split. What does it mean? What is the Braita of Rabbi Yishmael anyway? Some of you, if you look in your Sidurim, before Baruch She'amar, some of the publishers put like 20, 20 pages over there. I don't know where they put them there because nobody says it. But in the olden days, in the time of the Beit Magdash, they used to say these 20 pages. It has Kurbanot, it has Akedat Yitzchak, Anna Bechawah. To get your money's worth, so they gave you Zich in the Khurban, they put these 20 pages in. I'm saying that as a joke. Of course you have to pray the whole Siddur. You start from page 1, you don't start from page 43. So in that section of the, of the tefillah, right before Kaddish, there's a brayta, a passage of Rabbi Ishmael. Rabbi Ishmael says, "Bishlosh Yisrael midot haTorah nidreshet." There are thirteen uh, ways to study the Torah. Thirteen formulas that we use to study the Torah. What's the first one? Kalva Homer. You know what a Kalva Homer is? If this guy who's weak can carry 50 pounds, this guy that's strong, Kalvahomet can carry 50 pounds. If the weak guy can carry 50, the strong guy, Kalvahomet, we use that type of thinking in learning. If the halakha is over here by this, which is weak, certainly by the halakha, that's, that's Kalvahomet. You know what a Kalvahomet is, yes? So it says, the bright of Rabbi Ishmael, the yam ra'a bright of Rabbi Ishmael, it's sort of Kalvahomet. What do you mean? Later on in history, Another body of water split. This time it split for Yehoshua ben Nun, the student of Moshe, when he was crossing the Jordan. The Jordan also split, and Bnei said were able to cross safely. So the Yam made a kalvachomer. If the Jordan is going to split for the student of Moshe, kalvachomer, we have to split for the rabbi. So Hayam Ra'a, Mara'a, Bright and Rabbi Ishmael. And that's what the Pasuk is very good. Hayam Ra'a Bayanos. What did it see? Hayarden Yisov Le'ahor. The Yarden, he saw the Yarden Yisov his future. It saw that the Yarden Yisov. Ah, what the Yarden is Yisov, so that we have to split as well. That's Kalma Omer. But there's another Hazal. Hazal say, Hayam Ra'a Etarichush. They saw the loot. They saw the money. That night when we came out of Eretz Misraim, every Jew became an instant millionaire. That night, everybody became a millionaire. God fulfilled to us, We came out with the great wealth. Even though, by the way, I want to tell you something. That's not what a Kadosh Baruch Hu meant when he said Rechush Kadol. He promised Abraham, Can I ask you a simple question? What is Rechush Gadol? What is great wealth? So right away, your first reaction is going to be to give me a number. A great wealth, I don't know. Ten, ten million dollars. And somebody will say, nah, wait, ten million dollars, ten million dollars. Hundred million dollars. Hundred million dollars. Another guy will say, what are you talking about? You can't really answer me what is great wealth because that answer is relative to who's doing the talking. If I'm talking to Bill Gates, Navdil, and Bill Gates says, this guy over here, ah, he has a lot of wealth. Now, Bill Gates is worth $50 billion. So for him to get excited and say great wealth, he's got to be talking 40, 45 billion. Otherwise, he doesn't get excited. 
For Bill Gates, a person has a million dollars, a mesquine, he's, he's, he's on the welfare. But if you talk to a poor person who doesn't have food to eat, and he says, why, you see this guy over here? What a job he has. He works from 6 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, and they give him $20 a day. Why, a rich man. Because to the poor guy, this, that's rich. 20 bucks a day is rich. It's all relative wealth. It depends who's talking. HaKadosh Baruch Hu goes to Avraham. V'aharechen yitzu birchush gadol. Who's talking? HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is richer than Bill Gates, by the way. So, how much money are you talking for HaKadosh Baruch Hu that he gets excited that he says, Wow, they're going to leave with great, good, good money, good money. What's good money to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? He owns China. He owns all the continents. Ha'ares umlo'ah, tebel ve'yosh reva. He owns all the rivers and all the oceans and all the mountains. The whole world belongs to God. All of the world is God's acquisition. So what does Borel mean? Nothing is Rechush Gadol. Everything is pennies like Kadosh Baruch because he owns everything. Look who's talking. You know what the real shot is? It wasn't talking about the money. Borel Olam was referring to the Torah. The Rechush Gadol is the Torah. That's an asset. Even a Kadosh Baruch Hu gets excited when it comes to the Torah. You're going to leave Misraim and you're going to get the greatest asset, the book that I used as a blueprint to create the whole world, the book that has all the secrets of the creation from the beginning to the end, the holiest entity on the planet, a book that was already written 974 generations before B'riyat Ta'ala. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, even HaKadosh Baruch Hu gets excited when it comes to the Torah. He says, yes, this is the Chush Gadol, because that's spiritual. This is eternity. This is Olam Abba. But, there's some people when they read the Pesukim, they don't use their thumbs when they read the Pesukim. They read the Pesukim with their eyes. It says the Chush Gadol. The Chush Gadol is money. Don't give me uh, Bill Gates and this whole Andush over here. I want the money. The Chush Gadol is the money over here. Now all of a sudden you start using thumbs. It's okay, so Borei Olam is very generous. You know what? For the people that are the Pashtanim, for the people that like to read the Pshat, okay, the Chush Gadol, God's rich. Give them the money also. So it says, Hayam Ra'ah, what did it see? It saw the money. Ah, it's all the money? It's split. What's the Pshat now? Since when is money a sigula for a seat to split? You know what the pshat is? The Yam saw, look, the Egyptians gave the Jewish people the money. That means they really think that it's a three-day excursion. That means nobody spilled the beans. Nobody revealed the secret. If the Jewish people have all this money, that means they were able to be tight-lipped. And that zechut, the tikkun is made. Hayam ra'ah! And that's why, incidentally, it also says, Hayam Ra'at Aronos Shel Yosef, at the same time. Because Aronos Shel Yosef reminds the Yam of the Avon. And the Rechush reminds the Yam of the Tikkun of the Avon. And therefore, Ibn Yisrael, Halichu Bayabasha Betuch Hayam. Now watch this. Darizah writes, If somebody, Hasf Shalom, is a tail bearer, speaks Lashon Allah, an informant, a gossip mongerer, that Izal says that that person comes back as a Gilgul, as a dog, as if to say, you want to bark? Now you can bark all you want. You want to make noise, you want to get people in trouble, good. Now you can bark all day long. The one that barks as a human being comes back to bark as a dog, as a caliph. What does it say when the Jewish people left Egypt? When the Jewish people left Egypt, not one dog barked, which is not, not normal. When there's throngs of people walking and there's dogs, you know, they get nervous, they start screaming, they don't bark. At that moment, no dogs barked. 
God was giving a signal to Aklai Yisrael. You made your tikkun. You didn't bark on each other. You didn't reveal the secrets of each other. Hence, you even were able to affect the creation that the dogs by nature that normally bark, they also were fixed on that night as well. Now, if this is true what I'm telling you, just to go back to our original question, the unity is able to take away the judgment. How? If I'm united and we're all together, so when I'm working, I have pain because I'm working. I have tsar. But I also feel your tsar. So my work is really one and a half. It's mine and I feel yours. You're working also. You feel yours, you feel half of mine. So basically what happened was each one was feeling his pain and somebody else's. So each one is working one and a half times. So therefore the camaraderie was able to subtract 190 years. A simple as born. But watch this now. I want to tell you what the skull and the Rebbe said. He said like this. When you get to the next paragraph, after it tells us that we got out 190 years early, the next paragraph says, Visha Amda Lavotenu. Ah, everybody loves the Visha Amda. We lift up the cups, we cover the matzah, oh, Visha Amda. Highlight. And what do we say over in the Visha Amda? Shemichol Dor Vador. Om Dim Alenu Nechalotenu. In every single generation, there's somebody out there that's set on destroying us, to destroy us. Now, the conventional pshat in the Visha Amda is, who's the Bechol Dor Vador, Omdim Alenu? That's the Hamans, that's the Paros, that's the Hitlers, that, that ilk of anti-Semites that all had their version of the final solution. So we say, it's not a, it's not a new thing, anti-Semitism is as old as there's Jews. As long as there's Jews, there's going to be somebody who hates Jews. But miraculously, every generation, HaKadosh Baruch Hu saves us. That's the simple pshat. Says the skull in the Rebbe. I had the sifra, I can read it inside to you. Hear what he says. He writes like this. Vishamda. אין אנחנו מגדירים מי הם אלו העומדים עלינו לכלותנו. Who are these עומדים עלינו? How come we don't give names? We say it generically. בכל דור ודור עומדים עלינו. Who are these עומדים עלינו לכלותנו? אלא אומרים בדרך כללי, we say it in a general way, שבכל דור ודור עומדים עלינו. ונראה שכאן יש תפילה על המוסרים והמשומדים שבכל דור ודור. The skull and the Rebbe learns, you know who the enemies we're talking about over here? Are the enemies that are within. It's talking about the anti-Semitic Jews. It's talking about the ones that are amongst us. Not the anti-Semite from, from without, from far. Asher alehem nitkena birchat taminim betfilah. Don't we have a special berachat na'amida? Laminim velamalshinim alti tikva? Where we're praying not for the enemies on the outside, we're praying for the internal enemies. So he writes, Ube'emet, Enlanu derech lehin natsel meha moslim, ha me'uravim bekerbenu. There's no way we can really get saved from the internal. From the external enemy, we know who he is. We see him. We have a way to protect ourselves. But our God is down when it comes to the enemy that's within us. Nobody thinks that a self-hating Jew could come along and do damage to his brother. That already, it blindsides us. And therefore he says, We only can rely on the good graces of a Kadosh Baruch to save us. Now we understand the connection between the two paragraphs. First we say, Baruch Shomer Avtah Atol Yisrael, Shakadosh Baruch Hu Hishev Etaketz. God took us out early because there was unity. We went out to Egypt because of Mahloket. And once we rectified it, and where do you see we rectified it? Because three million people kept a secret. There were no more Srim. And because there was no Mesirah in Klai Yisrael, there was a redemption. And then we come along and say, but unfortunately this plagues us in every generation. Bechol Dor Vador, we have a repetition of this. Omdim Alenu from within. 
And then, do you know what the next paragraph is? The next paragraph is a proof to show you the extent of what the internal enemy can do. Tse'ulmad, go out and learn a lesson. Ma bikesh lavana arami la'asot li Yaakov abinu. What did Yaakov try to do to Lavan? What did Lavan try to do to Yaakov? Lavan was his father-in-law. That's not an outsider. Yaakov was married to Lavan's daughters. That's an internal affair. Now it's one thing a father-in-law to a son-in-law. We hear stories what they're capable of doing. But that he should want to kill his own daughters. Lavan bikesh na'akor etakol. Lavan wanted to go after his own grandchildren. That's the raya. Omdim alenu lechalotenu mibifnim. And you know what the proof is? Look, from the beginning of time, the biggest enemy to Yaakov was somebody that was living in the same house with him. He was living under the same roof. Who would believe it? You're looking for the enemy from over there. Lavan was right under his nose. And that's unfortunately what we're going through till today. And that's why the Galut is lasting so long. Unfortunately, the story of Misirut is still amongst us. Where Jews still have the ability to go and be Moser on one another. For whatever reasons, for whatever benefits they get. Unfortunately, it's, un- it's common where Jews can take each other to secular courts. This is a form of Misirah where they can go litigate Jews against a Jew in a secular court in front of Goyim, in order to expose all our dirty laundry, all our private secrets to the Goyim, to the newspapers, to the jury. But Hanul Hashem, besides the fact that it's a slap in the face to our system of Beddin, but to go to a secular court, one Jew to the other, Behold, Dor Vador, unfortunately, this is our weakness in every single generation. And let me tell you something. The enemy within, it's much more painful. When it comes externally, so you almost expect it. You're almost ready for that. But when it comes from your brother, when it comes from your neighbor, when it comes from one of your own, the pain is that much more. It's the story with the blacksmith and the goldsmith. The blacksmith was in his shop, and he has in his hand his iron hammer. And he's banging on the anvil. He's banging on the anvil. And as he bangs, the anvil lets out a big, a big noise. Boom, boom. The goldsmith next door also has an iron hammer. But he's banging on the gold. And as he bangs on the gold, it's a very dull sound. So the gold tells the anvil, I don't understand. Why when you get hit, you make such a loud scream? When I get hit, I hold it in, I don't make such a loud noise. So the anvil tells the gold, your gold, you're getting hit by an iron hammer. That's not related to you. So when you get hit by an outsider, it doesn't hurt you that much. I'm an iron anvil. I'm getting hit by my brother, the iron hammer. When the iron hammer hits the iron anvil, when the brother hits the brother, it hurts me much more. And therefore I cry much louder. And that's what that guy, that's teaching us. And that's what we have to remind our films on the night of the Seder. That yes, of course we left Egypt. Why did we leave Egypt? And why did we go down to Egypt? Karpas, it all started with the Ketonet Pasim. And once we rectified it, that no Jewish person, every person understood their loyalty and their obligations to one another. They were not Megales Sod. They did not reveal secrets. Everybody who said it's time to go, it's all the wealth. But then, unfortunately, years later, we went back to the old Sanat Hanam, back to Tisha Be'av, because we didn't learn the lesson of Monday night Pesach, we got Monday night of Tisha Be'av, they're linked at Bash Gardak. And that's what we have to impress upon our children the peace and the unity and the shalom.
Now I agree. Where do we begin with Shalom? None of you are going to broker a deal in the Middle East. We understand that. It doesn't start with that. Certainly none of us are capable to bring the Democrats and the Republicans together as well. In these days, that might even be more difficult than the Middle East. The Shalom begins in our homes. The Shalom begins in the Shalom Bayit. With the couples, with the marriages. Paron knew what it means, Shalom Bayit. You know what Rabbi Nishai says? Kol says, take all the baby boys, drown them. That I expect from Paro. But the next part of the Pasuk is shocking. Keep the girls alive. Hey, Paro, it's the same price. <laughs> Kill the girls also. What's Paro so interested in keeping the girls alive? You know what the Benin Shahai says? Because he wanted to make a disproportionate amount of women to men. So now each Jewish man would have to marry more than one wife. And if he's going to have to marry more than one wife, there's going to be rivalry amongst the wives. And there's going to be Shalom Bayit problems. There's going to be, so he went after the domestic tranquility of Klai Israel. That was his plan, to break the Shalom. He said, once already there's no Shalom Bayit, God's not going to redeem them. Shalom begins, children to their parents. Shalom begins with neighbors living next to each other. Shalom begins with friends in the Shi'ur. Shalom begins with the congregants in the synagogue. Shalom begins with us. And then, Be'adzat Hashem, if we can make this tikkun, it's in the days. If it happened already once in Nisan, this tikkun, there's a good chance it can happen again during Nisan. But it's not an automatic. It's not just a, 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 something that happens by chance or by itself. It needs work. And the work is dependent on learning the lesson of Lil Pesach. Yiratzon. Kadosh Baruch Hu should give us the ability to impart these messages to our children and our family. And Be'azat Hashem, we should be from the Talmidav Shul Aaron HaKohen, Ohave Shalom Verotfei Shalom, Ohave Abiriyot Umkareban LaTorah, and then will be fulfilled on us, Ki meset echa me'eris misraim, ar enu nifnaot, amen ve'amen. Rabotai, we collect for the Shamosh,